Hello and welcome to the breakdown video for our three pound beetle weight horizontal spinner Phantom 2. So Phantom 2 has been running for quite a while now in 10 competitions in total over three years but the design overall has remained largely consistent with some tweaks along the way. Now I'm going to show you guys kind of inside this robot give you guys a good look at how it's constructed and kind of explain some of the design features as I go. So why don't we get started. The first thing to take off from here is going to be the weapon. Now the weapon is a 3 inch AR500 blade which is mounted to the robot on this dead axle and is driven by a brushless outrunner here in the back using 3D printed pulleys and a 4mm urethane belt. The belt is kind of stretched on here and it, uh, it's got quite a bit of tension so we're just going to take this off. And this belt guard isn't actually attached. This is an AR400 steel belt guard meant to help protect the belt from uh, horizontal spinners but uh, it got knocked off uh, at uh, both of the last couple of events I went to actually. This is the spare. You can see the uh, tab is still on there from the water jet, so this spare actually hasn't been used or prepped for actual use yet. But uh, that's where the belt guard would go. Next we're going to take off the weapon here, just get this wrench on here, loosen these nuts. Normally I really crank these nuts down and the reason there's two of them is so that they can kind of tighten into each other. Use them as jam nuts so that they don't loosen, but it's really helpful to be able to remove this easily without needing to lock tight everything. Now, above and below the weapon hub here are a few spacers and then there are these things called thrust bearings. Now these thrust bearings are kind of like roller bearings except these take an axial load so that's why they're called thrust bearings. These allow me to kind of crank down on the weapon using the uh, the nuts on the weapon shaft and that kind of helps the weapon stay more stable, kind of helps reduce some of the play in here. This weapon is kind of, it's got some wobble on this needle roller bearing. So the needle roller bearing inside here, this is just a single needle roller bearing pressed into the blade and the upper and lower aluminum hubs. So the weapon has an aluminum hub which kind of helps support the weapon and have more contact length with the bearing and uh, then a 3D printed pulley which attaches to the hub. This is uh, 3D printed from Onyx, same as the, uh, the other pulley. Now a single needle roller bearing is not exactly ideal for this application. If you were to build a horizontal spinner, I would recommend that you use two bearings, preferably ball bearings. Needle roller bearings could work as long as you have two and have them spaced out with as much contact length along the weapon shaft as you can get. And that'll give you the most rigidity in that direction. Now the weapon bars themselves, I could do an entire separate video on how to design blades because a lot of factors go into this. So this is my blade for going against vertical spinners. I have kind of a really conservative just flat edge here. It's actually technically a negative rake. And then this relief profile kind of reduces the total area at the very end. So normally a rectangular or just a flat bar would have a 90 degree angle coming off of here. But the relief helps reduce the chance that a vertical spinner is going to come up and catch the underside of the blade. The old weapon shaft design used to be a, just a dowel rod held in with set screw hubs. Despite our best efforts to grind notches into the dowel pin and give the set screw hub something to, to grab onto, a vertical spinner hitting the edge of this blade would still pull the dowel rod up out of the robot. So in addition to trying to reduce the probability of that happening through the, the relief profile, we also use now a shoulder bolt for the weapon axle. So the head underneath the frame prevents it from being yanked up out of the frame. Now the other kind of main design has a positive rake angle and this is for digging into armor, large plows on the fronts of other robots. So that's kind of or more what I use this bar for. So next, let's open up the top of the robot and take a look inside. 
So as you can see, it's kind of an involved process taking all of this apart. That's kind of due to the way that this robot has been iterated on so many times that things like serviceability have kind of gone by the wayside in favor of needing to make changes to make it more competitive. So now this shoulder bolt weapon axle is held in rather than with set screws uh, using clamping hubs. The weapon motor here has this onyx pulley on top of it and uh, that just bolts on top of the motor bell so that can come right off. And here you can see up close the pulley with the round belt profile. Now for the top armor originally I used to use polycarbonate and here with the old frame that's kind of been turned into uh, the frame of Thumb War, the minibot for Bloodsport. You can see the polycarbonate top armor. Here's the old version of the aluminum top panel. I used to have a big hole in here because the receiver wouldn't fit properly. And then on the newer frame, from the one rebuild this robot has had, the polycarbonate top armor still stayed for a while, right up until the most recent event when I had this onyx top armor made. And this is quite a bit thicker than the polycarbonate. It's got some decorative features on here. It's, it's really pretty, or at least it was until it got hit in exactly the wrong way. But I am pleased with how this held up as a blade of armor. And most importantly, when the blade deflects due to the slop of the uh, needle roller bearing, so you can see this is actually the mark of my blade hitting my own robot, but this protected the motor and the motor pulley from that blade deflection. So inside here you can see there's a giant spaghetti of wiring. A lot of it's held back by tape so that it doesn't intersect with the weapon motor because that's obviously a very dangerous thing inside of a robot to have happen. The battery is a 1000 milliamp hour Galaxy LiPo from Fingertech. I am really happy with this. It is the most compact option I could find with this amount of power. The LiPo just kind of fits in here, and there's even more wire spaghetti that has to happen for that to plug in there. Originally, Phantom 2 had four smaller batteries out in these outer bays, but the issue was anytime this side armor would get pulled off or damaged, the batteries would be in danger, so that was not an ideal solution. And also, those tiny batteries really had no real current output, so the robot was kind of weak. Here's the uh, Hobby King T6 receiver that fits out here. I'm not super happy with the limited receiver choices on that radio. It is a cheap radio, it's worked well for my purposes, but I think in the not too distant future I'm going to invest in something a little more legit. The weapon motor itself is, I think, Eternogy Multistar Elite 4006, 740kV. So this is one of the other ones that had some damaged wiring in here. You can see I've got a uh, Fingertech power switch. And then let me just pull back this tape here. These JST connectors are not for um, batteries. Obviously, the battery uses this XT60 connector. Um, I have some of these JST connectors actually plugged in in reverse, which is kind of difficult to do. If you use JSTs for batteries, never do this. This will explode your batteries. But since I'm using these connectors for the brushed drive motors here, it's okay to reverse them just to get a different direction. The weapon motor here uses bullet connectors, so these can just pop apart when the weapon motor needs to be changed out. The drive itself uses tiny ESCs hooked up to the Fingertech Silver Sparks. Now, these Silver Sparks don't have the greatest reputation in beetle weights. I've found them to be kind of variable based on the batch. Some of them have worked really well for many, many fights. Uh, some of the others have died a little more quickly, so I've found it also it kind of comes down to how well you support them. In my setup, I have the, the motors supported by these 3D printed sleeves on the inside, and then there are bearings embedded in the frame rails, which allow me to support the shaft outside the gearbox and give the maximum support. And then I also use the foam finger tech wheels to prevent too much of a shock load going onto these gearboxes. This robot is actually designed to be able to drive upside down using the rear wheels. Unfortunately, in later configurations of the robot, it's been kind of front heavy with the armor, so it hasn't had the, the best weight distribution and traction on these rear wheels. And also the foam wheels are not super well suited for this kind of design. And then I've got UHMW side armor. On the original frame, these were aluminum bars, but they would just kind of get lobbed off. So UHMW just loses chunks. It's self-lubricating. It kind of slices away without actually breaking catastrophically. 
So it's it's pretty good in this kind of application for side armor. Here's kind of a close-up of the UHMW side armor. You can see it's kind of bent and beaten up. Here's a wedgelet, one of the aluminum wedgelets attached out here. These kind of help get underneath wedges. I've also got AR-500 wedgelets for when I'm fighting a drum spinner or a vertical spinner. These are better as armor. This front end here I call the fork wedge because it is kind of like a fixed front wedge but with forks protruding here. And the fixed wedge itself kind of helps prevent the forks from folding up too far and getting into my own weapon. This fork wedge is able to come off of the robot with not too many screws. Although it's not exactly an elegant transformation, it is doable between matches if you have time and not too many other repairs to do. Now behind this fork wedge is actually a 3D printed part which helps double support these interior forks. It also allows for even more forks to come out of the middle here if I want them to. So in order to get this all the way off, I also have to remove the shoulder bolts which come through here. And I can kind of slide this out. And here you can see the fork wedge itself. It's made of 0 0.05 inch thick 4130 steel which has been hardened and heat treated. The geometry here is kind of meant to fend off vertical spinners. So the, a vertical spinner will kind of come up against the edge of this and it is bent down in the front to hopefully prevent them from catching the leading edge but allow them to skitter off of here. The other front end I am able to put on here is the full wedge. Now this is a fixed wedge, it is not hinged so it doesn't scrape the ground, which is why I use the forks if I need to get under wedges or vertical spinners. But this wedge is actually mounted to an aluminum back plate. The back plate, it's missing a bunch of the screws, but the back plate is what mounts to the frame. And then the wedge is mounted by a bunch of screws with pieces of cut rubber tubing on either side of the aluminum back plate. So that allows a bit of flex. These are kind of DIY wubs. A wub is like a shock mount, a rubber mount, which allows something to move and vibrate and disperse kinetic energy rather than transferring it into the frame. So this helps me kind of resist horizontal spinners. This is, I believe, 0 0.08 inch thick 4130 steel, so really close to 2 millimeters thick hardened steel. This wedge has some marks on it, a lot of marks from um, Animus, marks from Vector. Here's a really big not super big, but a big chunk taken out of one side of it from Vector. I think even a kinetic kit chewed on kind of this leading edge at one point. But this has been a really strong wedge. This is harder than, than grade 5 titanium. It is a bit heavier, but since my robot is so small, I don't have to cover barely any area. So this is more wedge than even a D2 kit would have, but lighter weight because it's so much smaller. So if ever I need to replace a drive motor, it has become kind of a complex process because many of these bearings don't have a great fit in the actual frame rails. So I've had to bring the wheels in closer to the bearings to prevent them from sliding out. The wheels used to be further out on the shaft which meant I could just pry out these bearings without even needing to take off the wheels or the side armor. And then that from there I could just pull out the entire motor assembly. And these are just kind of slid in here into these sleeves. So these, these sleeves hold onto the drive motors and then the drive motors just kind of float in here. And then taking this out allows me to kind of get the internals apart. And you can see the weapon ESC which kind of sits underneath everything else. It's a Turnigy plush 30 amp weapon ESC. It's not the most aggressive weapon ESC, but it's a very solid speed controller. I've been using this thing. This is a, a holdover from Phantom 1, and it is the only part that I've been to in 11 events, I think 40 some odd fights. This speed controller has never given me any issues. It's the exact same speed controller too, not just the same model. So very reliable speed controller. I think in future versions of the robot, I'm gonna look for something which has a little bit more aggressive startup pulses just so that I can get a better spin-up time and a little more starting torque. Maybe that'll allow me to figure out some method of self-writing. So yeah, that is the teardown of Phantom 2 and a look at all of the internal components. It is not really that complex of a robot, 
but it's had a lot of thought going into all of the various features and parts. I'm hoping future iterations of this design are going to be a little simpler to build and maintain, while also getting rid of some of the rigidity issues and other problems that I've been trying to work away on this design. So, as always, thank you for watching, and happy roboting!